Today, we continue with our annual Summer Sermons by Other People series. During the month of August, members of the UU community of Cambria will present sermons written and delivered by UU ministers or other prominent members of the religious and academic communities. Our readers are required to seek permission to present these sermons, and the sermon will be introduced by the reader. Today's sermon is titled, This American Indian Life by Reverend Jennifer Youngson Rue to be read by Mary Schwalbe. The sermon covers the following principles. Principle one, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Principle two, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Principle three, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Principle six, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Principle seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Mary Schwalbe. Good morning. The definition of cancel culture, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is the practice or tendency of engaging in mass canceling as a way of expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure. And according to the Cambridge Dictionary, a way of behaving in a society or group, especially on social media, in which it is common to completely reject and stop supporting someone because they have said something or done something that offends you. Jennifer Rue is an affiliate minister of the Unitarian Church in Charleston, South Carolina. She received her Master's of Divinity from the Star King School in Berkeley and was ordained by the Congregation of Williamsburg, Virginia, UU Church, which she served for 10 years through 2016. Since then, she has done hospital chaplaincy work, currently serving the Roper St. Francis Hospital System in Charleston, South Carolina. Rev. Jen was born in Seoul, South Korea, and immigrated to the United States when she was six years old. She grew up in Toledo, Ohio. I often turn to Google when I'm troubled by a topic I don't quite understand. In this case, it, in this case, it was the term cancel culture, which bugs the heck out of me and is bandied about with passion and fewer by politicians and media pundits. I typed in you you cancel culture sermon and i found the sermon i will read today this american indian life was written and delivered by reverend jennifer youngson rue to the williamsburg uus in 2009 in 2021 its message is still very timely and speaks to the real cancel culture the real cancel culture and now the words of rev rue We'll Build a Land has always been one of my favorite hymns because it speaks of our responsibility to move the world toward freedom and justice. This hymn inspires us to act in the name of peace, to stand on the side of love, to reach out with our hands and speak out with our voices. We are not waiting for a supernatural being to come and save us from ourselves. We are not waiting for the second coming to establish justice on earth. We are the hands and feet of God. We are the ones we've been waiting for. The words of this hymn are based on the central Israelite story of the Exodus, a story about a people's deliverance from slavery into the promised land. This story describes a human experience of captivity in both as literal bondage and a spiritual one. The words portray the promised land as a blank canvas, a way to start over, an empty space where possibility is born. For thousands of years, these words have given hope to the Jewish people and Christians all over the world. Those who have suffered oppression and injustice have found spiritual liberation in this narrative of deliverance, particularly for African American and Latino American Christians the liberation theology that grew out of the Exodus theme assured them that God was on their side, the side of the powerless, the oppressed, 
all the afflicted, all those who mourn. Recently, some of my UU ministry colleagues who are Native American taught me that the imagery in this hymn does not speak to everyone in the same way. Not all the afflicted can find solace in this story. Not all those who mourn can place their faith in the promised land. Many of our friends and neighbors who are American Indians hear the Exodus story as one of conquest, not deliverance. The God of Exodus does not lead the Israelites to an empty land, but to one that is already occupied by indigenous peoples, the Canaanites. And what was God's instructions to the Israelites? Make peace with them? Live beside them in harmony? No. According to chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 of the book of Deuteronomy, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you are entering to take possession of it, then you must utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. When the first preachers came to proclaim the gospel on this new land, they often referred to the Native Americans as Canaanites sending the message that if Indians could not be converted to Christianity, their annihilation would be justified. Because this message was based on the fundamental biblical narrative that everyone knew, it became part of the American story. As the new inhabitants moved deeper into North America, this religious narrative became a central theme in the westward expansion. Embedded in the minds of those who shaped policies for this fledgling nation was the belief that this land was given by God and the existing inhabitants were be, to be assimilated or destroyed. As I listened to my colleagues, I realized that I knew very little about American Indian history and their current day struggles, so I started to read and listen. The more I heard, the more I want to know. The more I learned, the more questions I had, and the answers broke my heart. Not just for our American Indian neighbors, but for everyone who stands just at the edge of the American dream for the daily triumph of greed over generosity, domination over cooperation. We hear the life of American Indians through our history books, museums, and folklore. It's as though Indians no longer exist in our modern society. They have been silenced, marginalized, commercialized, and objectified. One example, one example of this can be found in our own Commonwealth, where the Virginia Council on Indians is managed through the Secretary of Natural Resources, along with fish and wildlife streams and fields and natural history. No wonder some Virginia Indians have taken up the model, we're still here. For 400 years, Virginia has had a complicated relationship with the indigenous people of this land. Even though they were the first tribes, they have yet to be recognized by the US government. A bit of good news though, last month, the House passed a bill and sent it on to the Senate. One of the complicating factors in pursuing federal recognition has been the ongoing legacy of the 34 bureaucratic reign of a white supremacist named Walter Ashby Plecker. Walter Plecker was a registrar of, regist of Virginia's Bureau of Vi Vital Statistics, recording births, marriages, and deaths from 1912 to 1946. Plecker led the effort to purify the white race in Virginia by forcing Indians and other non-whites to classify themselves as Blacks. There were only two boxes to check, either white or Black. If you were Indian, you could not claim your heritage. You could not claim your identity. You could not claim your name. It was genocide by paperwork. As an aside, as of 20, July 23rd, 2018, 574 tribal entities are formally recognized by the US and eligible for funding and services from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. According to Wikipedia, in California alone, there are still more than 100 tribes or bands waiting for federal recognition. Now back to Reveru. There is another uh, kind of bloodless genocide to kill off a people's culture identity by forced assimilation. 
In the 1870s, the US government separated small children from their families, shipping them off to Indian boarding schools. One of those schools was uh, the Carlisle Indian School, located on an abandoned military post in Pennsylvania. An army captain named Richard Platt offered this school. His ideas about educating children came from his experience running a prison for Indians. Here was his philosophy, quote, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with that sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man, end quote. By the mid 20th century, children were still being sent to Indian schools. That's really not that long ago. As recently as 1945, Bill Wright, a Butwin Indian, was sent to the Stewart Indian School in Nevada. He was just six years old. Wright remembers matrons bathing him in kerosene and shaving his head. Students at federal buildings, boarding schools were forbidden to express their culture. Everything from wearing long hair to speaking even a single Indian word. Wright said he lost not only his language, but also his Native American name. When he finally came home, his grandmother called him by his given name, Tutum. That's not my name, he said to her. My name is Billy. That's what they told me. We have been here forever, say our mother, our father. This is the name we call ourselves. I tell my sister, this is the name that gives our legs the music to shake the shells. A name that is unspeakable by those who disrespect us. A name with power to thread us through the dark to dawn and lead us faithfully to the stars. It is tempting to say, well, that was a long time ago and those ideas have been buried with the past. We look around today and find great affinity and respect for the Native American culture. Over the years, Native American spirituality has gained popularity with non-Indians. They are attracted to the mystery of sweat lodges, the sun dance, and powwows. One Aglala man observed that a hundred years ago, his people practiced their sacred ceremonies in secret, secret, excuse me, quoted from On the Res by Ian Fraser for fear that white people finding out and shutting them down. Today, the fear is of white people finding out and wanting to join in, end quote. Unitarian Universalists often use the words of Native American sages in our worship services. We appreciate Native American spirituality because it aligns with our respect for all beings and the interconnected web. We will play the music, invoke the prayers, and hang dream catchers from our rear view window. But very few of us take the time to learn our shared history and listen to the struggles of our American Indian neighbors. The trauma of being removed from ancestral homelands, forced to assimilate to a foreign culture and denied one's core identity may have happened decades ago, but the lifespan of a spiritual wound is longer than any one life. Deep pain, internalized shame, and rage reverberate through generations. What, what can I do to stand in solidarity with my Indian neighbors, friends, and colleagues? I will keep asking questions. I will keep listening. I will keep learning. And when I lead re worship, Using the words of Native Americans, I will find out where the words came from and connect them to a people and place. The chalice lighting words this morning were from Crazy Brave, a memoir by Joy Harjo of the Muscogee Creek Nation. She is currently serving her second term as the 23rd Pope Laureate, Poet Laureate, excuse me, of the United States. So do you want to support Indian country? Here's a short list of native native run organizations and nonprofits that I found on Joy Harjo's website. 
Honor the Earth uses indigenous wisdom, music, art, and the media to raise awareness and support for indigenous environmental issues. First Nations Development Institute strengthens Native American communities and economics and provides support to Native nations and Native-led organizations as they respond and recover to COVID-19. Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples mobilizes resources for crisis-impacted Indigenous communities throughout the world in rapid response to COVID-19, offers programs to protect land and water, create community vitality, and foster thriving women. NDN Collective is dedicated to building Indigenous power through organization, activism, philanthropy, grant making, capacity building, and narrative change, and creates sustainable solutions on Indigenous terms. Indigenous Environmental Network, its mission is to protect the sacredness of Earth Mother from contamination and exploitation by strengthening, maintaining, and respecting Indigenous teachings and natural laws. American Indian College Fund invests in Native students and tribal college education to transform lives and communities. More than ever, Native students and communities are struggling to overcome new challenges presented by the COVID-19 crisis. Muscogee Nation Youth System empowers the youth by connecting to culture, community, and resources. Native Governance Center provides Native people with leadership development, tribal governance, support, and community engagement. Tribal Law and Policy Institute provides free publication resources, comprehensive training, and technical assistance for Native nations and tribal justice systems in pursuit of a vision to empower Native communities to create and control their own institutions for the benefit of all community members now and for future generations. The 2009 GA General Assembly was held in Salt Lake City, Utah. The UUA president at that time was the, was the William, Reverend William Sinkford. <laughs> I encourage you to go on, on their website and view this, his seven minute video address entitled The Utes and the Unitarians. Now back to Rev Rue. The Ute Indians are descended from the Shoshone people. Before the arrival of European settlers, they roamed over vast areas of Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. At one point in the mid 1800s, a treaty with the United States guaranteed the Utes 12 million acres in Colorado and Utah in perpetuity. In per perpetuity. <laughs> Today, they own just 1. million acres. The remaining portion of the Uinita Ure Reservation, which is the second largest Indian reservation in the United States, covers over 4.5 million acres. It is controlled by the Bureau of Land Management. The Unitarians have an interesting connection to the Ute Indians. In 1871, President Grant charged the nation's churches to take on the education of Indian children. Their charge was to Christianize the Indians to aid in their civilization. That policy ended seven years later after a violent uprising resulted in the death of Nathan Meeker, the Unitarian agent to the Ute people. Nathan Meeker was from Ohio and he came to the Ute with a dream of building a utopian agricultural community. He believed that farming was the solution to the so-called Indian problem. But the real problem was that the Utes, the Ute Indians, were not farmers. They were hunters and fishers. They were people of the mountain. The Ute captured horses that escaped from Spanish settlements in the mid 1600s. On horseback, they traveled wide stretches of mountain lands where frost covered the ground 12 months a year. Nathan Meeker's utopian vision, his worldview shaped by the narratives of his European Christian culture collided with the Ute. A violent border skirmish between the US cavalry and the Ute warriors led to the removal of four Ute bands from Colorado to a small corner 
of eastern Utah. In a letter home, one cavalry soldier wrote that within days of the Ute Indian removal, removal white settler, settlers were already, were already laying down railroad tracks and laying out towns. One of those towns was Grand Junction, Colorado, which was opened for settlement the very day the Ute were removed from their ancestral homeland. I have no doubt that the Unitarian men held, held good and noble intentions in their relations with the Ute. I have read firsthand accounts from the Unitarian letters of the time, leaders of the time, excuse me, and they seemed sincere in their desire to help. But they were trapped in a mindset that understood civilized society in just one narrow way. Are we trapped in a similar mindset? In some ways, I think we are. I return to him, 121. We Unitarian Universalists have a tendency to see ourselves as the rescuers. We'll build it, we'll bind up the broken. We'll bring good tidings to the afflicted and all those who mourn. But let us not forget that the, we are also broken and we are afflicted and we mourn. We are captives of our stuck patterns of thinking and doing. We are captives of drink and drugs and overfunctioning. This song is as much for us as it is for anyone and is worth singing because it strengthens our moral imagination and helps us to envision a future where we who are faint and weak in spirit stand strong and justice shall roll down like waters.